Good morning. Welcome to Daylight Savings Time. Oops, I mean RUCC's worship service. Whether you're bright-eyed because you remembered to move your clocks forward an hour, or you're not and the coffee's still brewing because you forgot, you're welcome here whenever or wherever you are on life's journey. Welcome to worship. Creator God, in this season of Lent, as we learn about gratitude and explore different ways to embrace it through the visualization of a table of abundance versus a pyramid where rewards are greater for those at the top versus those at the base, open our eyes to the pyramids and tables around us and gently guide us on how to best represent you. Amen. This coming week on Wednesday is a special day, and that's St. Patrick's Day. And what's the one thing that just about everybody knows about St. Patrick's Day? And that's if you don't wear green, you get pinched, right? Mm-hmm. Well, what does that even mean? What does that have to do with St. Patrick? The fact is, nothing. It has nothing to do with St. Patrick. It has to do with being invisible to leprechauns, and if leprechaun sees you, anyway, we don't need that. What we need is St. Patrick, because he was a real person, about 1600 years ago. And he was not Irish, but he went to Ireland. In fact, he was kidnapped by pirates and taken to Ireland when he was just 16 years old. And he had to work there as a herdsman for six years before he escaped, went back to England, his home, and then he got a call from God, not that kind of call, but he felt a call to go back to Ireland and teach them about Jesus. And he did that. One of the ways, there's a legend, that one of the ways that he did that was, this is a plant, a shamrock. They have a lot of these in Ireland. And what Patrick did was he took 
a leaf from a shamrock plant. And this one is closed up because it's in the shade and cold. They open up in the sun. But we can see, if we look, it has three big leaves and one stem. And Patrick explained to the people that this is like God. God is just one thing, one stem, but on that one stem you have three different leaves, like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, like the Trinity. And that's how he explained to the people of Ireland how God was. And they could understand that. I can understand it. It makes perfect sense to me. And it made perfect sense to them too. So that's a little um, introduction to St. Patrick. And you know what, I'm not wearing green today, but there's nobody around to pinch me, so. <laughs> Good morning, and welcome to the fourth Sunday of Lent. Thank you to everyone involved in creating a meaningful worship service. Loring, Dan, Denise, Susie, Sophia, Zoe, Alexia, and Sue, who is providing special music for us. And thank you for participating virtually. Your presence is a gift. Today, we will be taking a special offering for the One Great Hour of Sharing. One Great Hour of Sharing is one of the four special offerings of the United Church of Christ we receive each year. And the offering helps the UCC to respond to disasters and different needs around the world. And here is a video to tell us a little more about this special offering. When it comes, everything changes. Children can go to school. Women can start businesses to help support their families. Crops can grow. Neighbors can take care of each other. Markets can thrive. Families can be families. When water comes to a village, everything changes. Water is essential to life and the life of a village. We are giving mixed projects like new wells in villages possible. Give to one great hour of sharing and let love flow. We hope that you will give generously to one great hour of sharing. You can write a check to Redlands UCC and in the memo write one great hour of sharing, or you can give through your Realm account. Thank you for supporting this important ministry. Following worship, we will hold our Zoom Fellowship Hour. This Tuesday at 7 p.m., we will hold our monthly board meeting. Board meetings are open, and if you are interested in attending that board meeting, you can contact Mary, our president, or me for the link. On Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., we will continue our wonderful Lenten series, Grateful. And in particular this week, we will be discussing the themes of grace, gratitude, 
and gifts. On Saturday, April 3rd, we will hold an Easter extravaganza for our children and teenagers. There will be an Easter egg hunt, cookie decorating, and games. This will take place at 10 a.m. on the patio. Everyone must be masked in order to participate. And finally, we will be holding a celebration of life service for our caretaker custodian, Jay Grayson, on Saturday, April 10th at noon. April 10th would have been Jay's 60th birthday. And so it's a fitting day to celebrate his life and life eternal. The service will be held on the church patio. Masks are required as well as six feet of physical distance from one another. And according to our protocol that the board adopted, we will need to limit the number of attendees to 50 people. So if you are interested in attending, please RSVP to our office administrator, Nancy, at office at redlandsucc.org or call the church office and leave a, your name and number. We will be live streaming this service for those who do not feel comfortable meeting in person. Again, the service will take place on April 10th at noon. We lift up the following prayer concerns. Bob, cousin of Sue, is transitioning from life to life. Marianne, mother of Kathy, is facing health challenges. Patricia, sister of Michael, fell at a construction site and injured herself. And we lift up Beth as she appeals the suspension of her driver's license due to an epileptic seizure. If you have any prayer concerns, please note those in the RUCC Members and Friends Facebook group. And during our prayer time each Sunday in Lent, we will participate in extinguishing a Lenten candle. And as the light grows dimmer in our eyes, may the light grow stronger in our hearts. On this one-year anniversary of the pandemic, I invite us into a prayer adapted from the SALT project that encompasses the joys and sorrows, brokenness and healing of this past year. Let us be a congregation at prayer. Good Shepherd, thank you for walking with us through this valley of the shadow of death through the suffering, the anxiety, the longing for closeness and the longing for personal space, the impatience and hope, the good days and the bad. Forgive us for our suspicions of each other, the ways this ordeal has made us more divided as a country and a world. Help us bridge our differences and come together even as we are physically distant. Forgive us for the iniquities this pandemic has exposed. Kindle in our hearts a new commitment to justice as we build and rebuild our community together. Keep us ever mindful of those most in need. We pray especially for those who have lost loved ones, lost jobs, lost hope. Gentle God, we ask that you continue to keep watch with those who work or watch or weep this day. Walk with those bodies that are holding memories of sickness, of pain, of isolation. Give your angels charge over those who still cannot sleep because of anxiety or grief. Tend the sick. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, shield the joyous, 
all for your love's sake. God of life and hope, lift our spirits as we dare to look ahead, dare to hope and dream about the new world to come. Strengthen our efforts, deepen our wisdom, so we might hasten that day. And until that day, keep our eyes and our hearts open to the signs of hope and life all around us, for new ways to connect with each other, We give you thanks and praise for teachers and nurses and doctors and agricultural workers and grocery clerks and small business owners and frontline workers of all kinds. We give you thanks and praise for the beautiful hope of being together again in person one day, lifting our voices in song, passing the peace, sharing cups of coffee, being able to hug one another again. For that day is surely coming. We give you thanks and praise. And for the ways in which our eyes have been opened, for the ways in which our hearts have been broken and put back together differently, softer and more attuned to the needs of the most vulnerable, we give you thanks and praise. For all of these things and more, gentle God, we give you thanks and praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. It is God's love that warms me in the sun. God's love that sends the cold rain It is God's love that feeds me in the bread I eat And God who feeds me by hunger and fasting It is the love of God that sends the winter days when I'm cold and sick and the hot summer when I labor and my clothes are full of sweat But it is God who breathes on me with light winds off the river and in breezes out of the wood. Her love spreads the shade of the sycamore over my head and sends the water from the wheat field with a bucket from the spring it is God who speaks to me in the birds and the streams but also behind the clamor of the city God speaks to me in his judgments and all these things are seeds sent to me from the will and by accepting all things from her I receive his joy into my soul it is God's love it is God's love in everything it is God's love it is God's love in everything
This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they'd come out of Egypt, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If we'd only died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate the food we wanted. But you've brought us out here to the desert to starve the entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them to see whether they follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said. You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in a cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. Thus ends the reading of the scripture. Awakening to beauty is to find the well that never runs dry, for it is in beginning to truly see the world with our spirits that our soul's thirst is quenched. The resilience and beauty of the natural world is a sign of hope, even when things are difficult. A tree is scorched by fire, and yet new sprouts shoot up, 
defiant and optimistically reaching toward the sun. A crack in a sidewalk reveals the seeds just beneath the surface, just waiting for a chance to break through. Divine beauty shimmers and shimmies through the universe and in every barrio where someone is singing or weeping. Because of beauty, our spirits are enlivened and we are capable of new life. Our Wednesday evening Lenten study is entitled Grateful and is based on Diana Butler Bass's book, Grateful, The Transformative Power of Giving Thanks. And this past Wednesday evening, I found the discussion to be particularly stimulating as we discussed Butler Bass's connection between tables of abundance and gratitude. That is, we experience the God of abundance at tables, and our response is heartfelt gratitude. And in all of my years of studying scripture, I have never consciously viewed the Bible through the lens of the table. But Butler Bass does just that. She begins with today's scripture passage. The ancient Israelites leave slavery where Pharaoh controlled every movement of their lives. And with the Passover, they leave slavery and go to what becomes the Holy Land, the land flowing with an abundance of milk and honey. They pass over from scarcity to abundance. At first, the Israelites are dancing and singing and clapping their hands, But on day three, they become afraid. Who's going to take care of us? We're going to starve to death. Let's go back to Egypt. Yes, we lived as enslaved persons and they sold our children, but at least we had food to eat. There is nothing to eat out here. After all, complained the Israelites, Can God set a table in the wilderness? And in the words of Diana Butler Bass, God says, damn right I can. And manna falls from heaven and water comes from the rock and there is all of a sudden abundance. And this story, says Butler Bass, is being replayed on Thursday night of Holy Week before Jesus dies. It's a story about people passing from slavery into the freedom of abundance. 
Jesus is saying, just in the same way God took your ancestors out of slavery with Pharaoh, so too I'm taking you out of slavery from Caesar. And I'm bringing you to a new age, an age of freedom, of the exodus, of liberation. Butler Bass goes on to say, So often we get hung up with what happens on Good Friday on the cross. But I think for the disciples, the real insight, the power and depth of what was going on happened the night before. It happened on Thursday. Thursday night is the Last Supper of a world of oppression and violence and control. It is the Last Supper of all of that, but it is the first feast. It's the first feast of the world that God has always dreamed of. Good Friday becomes such a devastation, not only because we are the disciples are watching the murderous, violent execution of their friend, but in fact, what Rome is doing by destroying Jesus' body is destroying the table. Rome does not want a table where all people are fed. And Good Friday is not just Jesus' body dying on the cross. It's literally Rome coming in and taking axes to the table and making sure that that table is never set. Because if that table is set, Rome is doomed and the pyramid of hierarchy is demolished. Good Friday is about the destruction of a body and the destruction of a table and the destruction of a feast. And that's why Easter Sunday becomes so extraordinary. Because God says, enough, you're not going to do it. You're not going to get away with it this time. There have been too many acts of violence that destroyed my table. No more Pharaoh, no more Caesar. I am going to reset this table. And sure enough, when we look at the post-resurrection accounts of Jesus, almost all of those appearances happen around a table. Jesus breaks bread on the road to Emmaus. Jesus shows up at the table where all the disciples are gathered and breathes a prayer of peace upon them. And Jesus feeds the disciples on the beach with fish. There is somewhere between 10 and 15 post-resurrection accounts, and the vast majority of these take place around a meal. Jesus does not come back and say, Hey, look at the cross. Look at the violent instrument of death that Caesar tried to use to stop all this. Jesus does not point to the cross. Jesus points to the table. And so, says Butler Bass, we should not wear crosses around our neck. We should be wearing circles that represent tables because that's the point. Wow! We should not wear crosses around our neck, she says. We should be wearing circles that represent tables because that was Jesus' point. Extraordinary. And until this Lenten season, I had never read scripture through the lens of the table. And yet tables are everywhere throughout the Bible. Tables represent abundance, provision, a place for everyone. And our response to these tables of abundance is gratitude. Now, I personally would not go so far to say, don't wear a cross around your neck. For some people, the cross holds significant meaning, and I want to honor that. But in the midst of the cross, let's elevate the table to its rightful place in Scripture and in the Judeo-Christian tradition. For our God sets a table of abundance, even in the wilderness. 
We know something about the wilderness, don't we? It was a year ago this weekend that we first canceled our in-person worship. It happened right in the middle of Lent. We expected that our building would be closed for two weeks. Two weeks. At that time, that sounded extreme. But our Lenten wilderness did not last for two weeks. It did not last for 40 days. No, our Lenten wilderness has extended to a full year. And we have called this Lenten wilderness unprecedented. Are you tired of hearing that word unprecedented? Of course, there have been other times in history that have been considered unprecedented. The the Israelites in the wilderness wandered for 40 years. That was unprecedented. Noah and the ark, unprecedented. Daniel and the lion's den, unprecedented. But the good news is we worship an unprecedented God, a God who rebuilds what has been destroyed, who gathers what has been scattered, who knows us better than we know ourselves or our situation. There are times in our lives, moments in history when things get unimaginably hard and we don't know what to do. But the good news is that we worship an unprecedented God, a God who sets a table of abundance in the wilderness, a God who beguiles us with beauty, even in the most unlikely places. I experience God's table of abundance through our extraordinary virtual worship services through our meaningful education events for children, youth, and adults, through the creativity of the mystery artist, through the care of mask makers, through the experience, the compassionate experience in our drive-by showers of love, through the competence of our board and members, through the tenderness of our shepherd groups, through the generosity of our givers, through the vibrancy of our music, through the love and unity of our members, and the list goes on. A year ago, I found myself asking, can God set a table in the wilderness? And God said, damn right I can. Let us give thanks that during these unprecedented times, we worship an unprecedented God who sets a table in the wilderness. Amen.
Creator God, we thank you for the many gifts you provide for your children. The sunshine and the rain needed to provide food for your table of abundance, our health, our families, our friends. God, gently nudge us to move when we need to create more space at the table for others, regardless of who they are or where they come from. Amen. As you go forth, I invite you into the contemplative practice of gratitude. In the Hebrew scriptures, the Jewish people offered a table blessing before their meal, and they offered a prayer of thanksgiving after their meal, so that the entire meal was framed with gratitude. And this week, as you sit down to eat, I encourage you to offer a table blessing before the meal and to offer a prayer of thanksgiving after your meal, so that likewise your entire meal is framed with gratitude too. And in so doing, we celebrate our unprecedented God who sets a table even in the wilderness. Amen? Amen. <laughs>